When you were last here, I remember the judges had uh, one or two helpful suggestions. That's right. Dr Mary Archer made two important points. First, when the lights faded down, they didn't all go off together. So I went away and wrote a totally new fade down routine to enable the lights to do this, as they now do. She also pointed out that in fading up or fading down the lights, there was this stepping effect. So I've combated this by speeding up the computer interrupt routine by a factor of eight. And this solves the problem. Any other problems you've ironed out? Well, previously, when we switched the lights on and off very fast, about 100 times a second, we could only deal with powers that we use in, say, normal household lights. But now we've upgraded it to 4 kilowatts. From the Royal Grammar School, Newcastle, Graham Harker and Anthony McKay. And they face further questions now, first from Dr Mary Archer. Anthony, you've designed your system very carefully to be as idiot-proof as possible, quite rightly, so that a stage manager with very little technical knowledge could arrange what he wants and program it in to the tape deck. Would he then be able to take the machine around with him and use it to operate other people's stage lights, supposing he were taking a repertory company around or something? That's right. If he, had, um, if he was moving the whole console around, he could take the whole thing away, having been switched off transport it around, set it up wherever he's using it, put in the tape and he's all ready to go. He doesn't need his lights? No. Graham, one of the impressive things about the uh, setup, your setup that we saw on the film was that you can display a histogram uh, on the computer a display uh, which tells you the level that the lights are at. Uh, isn't this unique or does this occur anywhere else in other, any other system of stage well, lighting? The equivalent um, display that uh, most professional systems use is a, simply a, a digital readout of the intensity. Um, this, the histogram you, you're mentioning is, uh, is an innovation we've had to uh, have an analogue representation of the light intensity which is obviously the height of the bar graph. But let me get it right. Is it, uh, is it telling us what the lights are actually doing, or is it telling us what you're asking the lights to do? Well, it's, it's telling you exactly what you've put in. Yeah, so if you had a bulb failure, um, it wouldn't necessarily tell you on the screen. You would Indeed have to it look no, at it visually. No. Mm, I see. Anthony, a big improvement <coughs> since last, last time is the way that you've changed the programming to dim the, the light together. Right. Could you tell us a little bit more about that and how you achieved it? Yeah, originally um, it was pointed out to us by Dr Mary Archer that when the lights faded down, yes. um, they didn't all land together. I, the brightest light went off last. So we've now changed, I've now changed the programme itself so that the lights all land together, which is a much more desirable effect for theatres. But they don't all start dimming together, do they? The brightest one starts first. That, that's correct. Um, the way it's achieved professionally is using very complex analog electronics, which is very difficult to simulate using digital computers. Um, so therefore, I've had to use a sort of pseudo technique to uh, improvise on this. Their analog uh, processing, needless to say, is very, very expensive. Mm -hmm. But the effect that you produce would be acceptable, you think? Would yes. It? Well, in fact, in our present theatre with the sliders, exactly the same result is achieved by putting a wooden block across the sliders and pulling it down. Yes. Anthony, you're the software man, aren't you? That's right. You used uh, basic and machine code in your programming. Why did you use the two? Well, basic um, is a high-level language. Um, it enables you to type in in English. Um, however, this has got to be converted by the computer into machine code. Now, this takes a long time because it's got an awful lot of work to do. Now, with our lights, um, everything has got to happen really quick. And, you know, basic is just too slow for the actual interrupt routine. So I've had to write this in machine code, and it does it up to a thousand times faster. Harder language for you, easier language for the microprocessor. That's right. Thank you very much, Graham. Thank you. Anthony. So now our judges must make their final choice. And, of course, it's a decision they've been mulling over all day. While they do that, let me just remind you that our winning team will be going through to the European Young Scientist Competition organised by Philips Industries and held each year in a different European city. This year it's going to be in Amsterdam, a lovely place. That's in May and there they'll have a chance of winning a substantial money prize. Before we hear the decision from our judges, I can also announce the four awards that have been made this year by other experts, four additional prizes, and this, of course, is a completely new departure for the Young Scientist programme. Now, the first of them comes from New Scientist magazine and a prize of £100 for the team with the most imaginative and best documented project. Well, the magazines made the award jointly to the girls of Parkstone Grammar School in Dorset, 
With their research on barnacles and the team which beat them in our very first heat, the girls of Bexhill College are with us today in the studio. Congratulations to them and to their schools who actually get the money. Well, next, an Institute of Biology Award for the best piece of biology in their view. And that goes again to the girls from Parkstone Grammar School in Dorset. The Institute's award is £50 to their school and a book to each of them. The Institute of Measurement and Control is presenting an award for the best appreciation and application of measurement techniques. And their award goes to the Orange Hill School at Edgware in North London for their project to design and produce a machine to diagnose disorders in the way people walk. To their school goes £100 and an Institute medal. Well, lastly, among these extra awards this year is one from the Daily Star newspaper for the best young, young scientist. And that goes, uh, without much competition, I would think, to Jeremy Skirchley, our 11-year-old light bulb expert from Ravensdale School, Derby. Uh, he gets a cup and shares £250 with his school. So, our congratulations to all of those winners. But now comes the moment, who have our own judges selected? As usual, we'll have summaries from each of them on each of the teams. I think I'm going to ask Colin Blakemore to start with their appreciation of the girls of Bexhill College and their project on absent-mindedness. Well, we were most impressed by how professional the girls from Bexhill were in their study of absent-mindedness. And let's be clear, psychology isn't physics and, and, and chemistry. Uh, with a subject as complicated as this, it's really quite an achievement to design simple, clear experiments. If this study could have been done simply, it would have been done long ago. Uh, in some ways, this team has actually beaten the experts. There are a number of groups around the world who are tackling this problem, uh, but only the Bexhill girls seem to have discovered a test that can distinguish people who are very absent-minded from those who aren't. An ingenious study of really quite a difficult subject. Sir George Porter, Tynemouth and Enzymes. Well, the Tynemouth project started as a pure scientific study of enzyme reactions, but very soon, uh, the team realised that this reaction could be used for the sterilisation of water. And they went ahead with this idea, even to the extent of doing a quite realistic assessment of the economics of the process. In the end, it turns out that the process could probably be better done without using enzymes at all. But they have given us a very good example of what can be done with the simplest apparatus. Wrexham and their bees, Professor David Nichols. This team has learned a great deal about the biology and life history of bees, looking for a pollinator which is more convenient for use in glass houses than the honeybee, so that pollination can uh, uh, be carried out during the winter to improve crop production. But like so many experiments, things didn't go too well in some respects, and in fact they have not yet come up with a, a package that can be uh, shown to growers. Nonetheless, it's a promising start that may one day lead to greater efficiency in crop production in this country. Dr. Mary Archer, Newcastle and the Theatre Lights. We thought this was an outstandingly successful project. Graham and Anthony identified a genuine problem in theatre lighting control and they solved it with great economy and elegance. We were particularly impressed by the intrepid way they got inside their machine and used its internal clock for their interrupt routine. So all in all, they've produced a system that can be readily operated by a completely non-technical person to store sophisticated lighting systems permanently. And we think such a system has a very real future. Once again, it's been a very hard-fought contest this year, uh, and with some very bright young scientists along the way. It was good to see such a varied group of projects in the final, but that's posed some problems for the judges. But a winner there must be, and a winner there is. So here are the scores. To the Bex Hill team, for their thorough study of absent-mindedness, 73 points. To the boys from Tynemouth who are trying to harness enzymes for industrial purposes, we gave 57 points. For their efforts to put bumblebees in the greenhouse, we gave the Wrexham team 66 points. And finally, the two electronics experts from Newcastle, for their very clever application of computer control to theatre lights, 79 points.
So the team from the Royal Grammar School, Newcastle upon Tyne, wins our trophy, which Sir George Porter, as director, will now present on behalf of the Royal Institution. Well, this is the apparatus of another young scientist called Michael Faraday, but he seems to have got away with simpler electronics than you did. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Well done. Thank you very much. Can I just tell you that Sir George Porter has also presented to each of the teams taking part in our final a ten-volume set of the discourses at the Royal Institution since 1851. So, Anthony and Graham now have the opportunity of spending nine days on the continent in the spring. Our congratulations once again to them. And can I just say thank you to all the competitors who've taken part in this year's competition and, of course, to all our judges. Until next year, goodbye. Very handsome, Do you know about it?